Good morning. Uh, this is slightly strange because I'm not used to doing webinars where I can see nobody uh, except uh, my fellow presenters. And everybody knows me. My name's Tony Kane. This is probably my last uh, official um, function for a latch show for, for a little while, at least. As you know, I'm away working in Clackman and uh, covering for Murray Sharp, who I think might also be with us this morning. Uh, so I'm not going to take very long. This is the first of a series of four um, masterclass sessions that we hope to organize uh, this year, as we did in the previous couple of years. This one focusing on the practical issues around heat pumps, how they work, and the, the some of the technical and practical implications about large scale installation programs that we're being invited to uh, uh, engage in over the next uh, 10 or 15 years or so. Um, that's me. I'm done. I'm going to leave you to uh, Sarah Buchanan and the team from uh, the Built Environment Smarter Transformation team who are going to lead the whole process today. Thank you. Thanks, Tony. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining us at the Alacho Masterclass on Retrofit and Heat Pump Technology. I'm Sarah Buchanan. I'm the Impact Manager for Retrofit at Built Environment Smarter Transformation, formerly known as Construction Scotland Innovation Centre. Uh, I'm going to be hosting the webinar today. We've got some fantastic speakers for you. Um, and the aim of today is to provide some technical insight and expert knowledge from the heat pump experts. Um, and then we'll have a question and answer session. So uh, we should be finished by around 12 o'clock. And just to give you some context, BEST are the National Innovation Centre for Scotland. And our mission is to accelerate the built environment's transition to zero carbon emissions. So we work with public sector, private sector, clients, contractors, supply chain, products and services. Uh, and our mission is to connect those networks and help people understand what their targets are and how they can deliver um, net zero carbon emissions. So today, part of our work focuses on the retrofit. That's the team that I myself sit in. Um, and we are providing um, technical guidance, case studies, resources, we also have funding to put into projects for academic support. So if any of you are considering a retrofit program, you're struggling with how to start, you want some technical advice or help, or you want to look at other areas of retrofit, we can help with that. So do get in touch. Um, our kind of focus is around the heat and building strategy, how we deliver that, the just transition, and a number of other economic policies, which I won't name off today, um, housing for 2040. Um, so we also have an innovation factory at Blantyre. So if you haven't been to the, the centre, please do come along. It's myself that takes the tours. I'd love to show you around. Um, it's a completely free resource for Scotland, for anyone who works in the built environment. So uh, do get in touch or come along and I'll send a more detailed presentation after today's webinar. So um, we just delivered the low carbon skills programme to over 900 delegates. And that was looking at retrofit, um, fabric first structure, um, lots of practical training sessions um, in the factory and we still have courses running in June so do go on the website and have a look um, and sign up completely for free um, and it'll really help you with your knowledge. Um, so yeah without further ado um, I'd just like to go through some housekeeping. The session is going to be recorded today um, you will be able to access it on our YouTube channel. If you'd like to ask a question or leave a comment you just do it in the right hand side box all of your questions and comments are really important to us. Um, and if we don't manage to get back to you today, we will get back to you and answer your questions. I expect it's going to be a really lively discussion today. Um, and we're also going to ask you a couple of poll questions as well, just to check your sense um, of um, knowledge and understanding of retrofit and, and where we can help. Your feedback is extremely valuable. Um, so we will take all questions and comments on board, um, even if we don't have time to answer them all today. So let's go on to our first speaker. Um, who is Barbara Lanster from John Gilbert Architects. Barbara is an experienced building performance specialist and retrofit coordinator. Um, she leads the Hab Lab Building Performance Evaluation Service and Deep Retrofit Projects at John Gilbert Architects. Um, she focuses on uh, energy efficiency assessment, energy modelling, performance gas, gas assessment. Um, she has worked on the majority of this work for community organisations, public bodies and housing associations. She's the winner of the Saltires Society's Innovation and Housing Award, um, and she's extensive research uh, experience in passive house projects and is currently working on Enerfit projects across Scotland, including the Nidri Road, Glasgow. So delighted to have Barbara here today. And uh, yeah, let's hear from Barbara. Barbara, you're still on mute. Just... Right, is that working now? Apologies for that. Hello. Good morning, everyone. Well, thanks very much for inviting me today for this. So I'll, uh, 
I will start. So I will, I will try today to give you a very brief um, presentation on, on the challenges and um, opportunities that we have when um, specifying heat pumps uh, on retrofit buildings. So I'm, um, I'm trained as an architect and I spent my last about 10 years on retrofit and building performance evaluation. I've done a good amount of, uh, of POE, so post-occupancy studies. I've visited lots of buildings and uh, lots of buildings in Scotland. I, um, I've been working on in John Gilbert Architects for the last seven years and I'm an associate director now. So I think I, uh, we have been working on this for a while. Um, in, and I would like to uh, start my presentation on talking a little bit about the context. So we know that we have very challenging um, targets to meet to uh, be able to reduce carbon emission um, in the UK, in Scotland, in Europe and in the world. Um, and in that context, um, in, in, in the Scottish context, we have still Many, uh, big proportions of homes that are still uh, falling under EPC band uh, F and G. So we do have to keep this in mind, and you probably know this, but I would. This is just a reminder. This is our starting point. Very ambitious targets, very stringent targets for a very very important reason, which is to mitigate uh, and or and climate change. Uh, and provide uh, warmer, healthier homes. So, but we do have this challenge. There are many properties, mainly pre-1919 properties, off-grid, oil fuel properties, private rented properties, properties and detached, semi-detached and tenements, which fall under uh, FNG. And we also know that zero carbon energy, this being heat pumps or other uh, technologies, will ultimately, ultimately sorry, be delivered by electricity. So there are a big challenge on that. We know the cost and increasing cost of electricity. So we need, we, having said that, we know that we need to retrofit our buildings to make sure that these new systems are running in a cost-effective ma ma manner and uh, not only in theory, as the ABC says, but in practice. So, First considerations here um, are these buildings that we were talking about and other buildings. Uh, are they heat pump ready? Can we fit a heat pump today as the buildings are as, as they are today? So we know that most of these archetypes need substantial air tightness and insulation improvements prior to the, the installation of these new systems. Uh, and this is mainly to provide lower energy bills, but also comfortable um, and, and warmer, healthier homes. Heat pumps require lower uh, floor temperatures. N the next speakers will talk more in detail about heat pumps and the, and the different technologies. And if heat demand is not reduced, energy bills can increase dramatically. So there is a relation there. If we are approaching retrofit, it needs to be in a holistic way. We do need to understand what we have and how that can be uh, should be improved in order to fit the heat pumps. So, the, if that's and if that's not happen, it will impact vulnerable tenants and tenants in general. Uh, it will impact their health and uh, it will um, also affect people who are uh, fall under a few poverty conditions. So, key strategies for a successful retrofit include first looking at the fabric first. Uh, approach, so uh, approaching it uh, on a fabric first approach basis, that means to reduce the heat load as much as possible. This will vary from archetype to archetype. It might not be as easy in one case or the other, but we do have to consider it and we have to have a strategy for it. The second one, remove fossil fuel heat sources. A good alternative for that is heat pump and we'll look at that in the next slides. And the third one is generate other renewable energy and uh, to combine it with this uh, new systems and possibly heat pump. 
So the other question would be if we're going, if we prepare a, a strategy and we see that we can actually, because of um, of, of disruption limitations or or because of budget limitations, we can really uh, go for a deep retrofit. If we go with a shallow retrofit, will we meet the government's um, targets? And the, the answer is, unfortunately, as you probably know, it's it's a no. We, we're not going to meet it. And it's explained very nicely in that graph that's part of the Letty Guide for um, retrofit. And I, I do recommend you to look at that guide, which is uh, free to download. So we know that most of the things that we discussed before, EPCs are based on SAP, which don't model um, a, 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 buildings accurately. They're great, they're, it's, they're good tools as compliance tools, but they not necessarily reflect reality. So we know that deep, retrof deep uh, retrofit strategies are needed to meet the um, carbon emission uh, reduction targets. And we know there is a performance gap issue. So uh, uh, what we choose in, in our office and many practitioners and many studies have confirmed is that we need robust retrofit uh, standards to, to, implement, um, to implement deep retrofit strategies and minimize the performance gap. And that's some of the standards are passed in 35, NRFIT and AACB. And if it's not possible to install it all in one, it's possible to, uh, it's good to analyze uh, retrofit strategies on a step-by-step -step approach. So, which are which of the, the many systems are around there are suitable for existing buildings? Solar thermal, PV, and uh, biofuel uh, boilers, and many times communal heat ends are generally discarded uh, for tenement buildings due to location, planning, and space restrictions. So, there's a limited things that you can do for tenements and in dense areas. So, um, that's a big group of, of buildings, and that's a very big proportion of buildings. PV, solar thermals, and heat batteries are generally okay for detached, semi-detached houses, and great if used together with heat pumps, and great if it, uh, concerted in a holistic way. Uh, so options for tenement buildings or buildings in uh, uh, urban or dense areas can be air source heat pumps in, in some sometimes, but mainly in ground floor flats and first floor flats because outdoor units can be fitted to the um, um, to the elevations many times for planning uh, restriction due to planning restrictions. Ground source heat pumps are great, but many times not feasible um, in in dense areas, and also depending on the, also depending on the, they're not that efficient due to the location. So. We also have to consider hybrid systems, so a mix between direct electric panels with maybe a compact air source heat pump and connected to so, uh, solar PV systems. So it's not one system to the other. The answer is probably a mix of the systems. And of course, we have to think out of the box and think of heat networks, but I won't be able to cover that because I'm I, that's not my expertise, but I'll leave that open. Um, to discuss maybe um, in other opportunities. So the opportunities that we have, we many people agree that for the vast majority of homes, depending on the location and conditions, heat pumps are the best option to, to decarbonize properties. But uh, we probably have to look at a hybrid system. Heat pumps are very efficient in practice if designed properly and they provide low running costs and high comfort levels also if designed properly. Challenges, high capital costs, planning restrictions, building form and archetype many times not feasible because there's limited internal space. There's a lack of uh, also um, lack of skills to install and design these buildings. And clients and tenants don't know the system, so we do have to invest a lot of time and resources to inform how the systems perform. Uh, and one of the limitations is that RDSAP, which is the main compliance tool for existing buildings, doesn't uh, model the systems in, in details, so it's difficult to specify them. So I'll try to cover very briefly what we considered for Nitri Road, which is a deep retrofit project and an NRFIT project. 
lucky they didn't glass them for the ones that you don't know. So the pros, the, the, what I didn't really cover it before, it's that the uh, properties the eight flats um, that are part of a close were void. So that's a very big, uh, that's really good uh, starting point because occupied properties are a very big uh, challenge for retrofit. 100% of the properties were owned by the same, by Southside Housing Association. So that's a lot, that's a lot of benefits for to, to start with. Challenging is that existing uh, fabric conditions were very poor. There was a lot to do on that. There was limited internal space. PV systems were not feasible due to limited roof uh, space. Ground surveillance was not feasible. We looked at that and it wasn't possible. And planning restrictions were lots, but, but, but there were many <laughs> planning restrictions. There was very little that we can propose on the uh, front elevations, and there were also restrictions to the rear. So the systems, I'm not going to talk about the fabric because it's really not the topic of this presentation, but of course we followed a fabric first approach. We followed NFIT recommendations. So we lowered the, the heat load as much as we could, as much as you possibly can do for a building of this kind. And then once we have uh, we had done that, we looked at different strategies to for low carbon uh, technologies. Uh, we discarded photovoltaic systems and we went for a hybrid space heating um, and domestic hot water approach. Uh, air source heat pumps in the ground and first floor due to rest restrictions of having uh, outdoor units um, on the elevation and uh, um, efficient condensing boilers in the top floor flats. Today, I would have done it differently. I would have considered a compact unit in the upper floor of heat pans. This was a couple of years ago when we started specifying it. Technologies and costs were different, and that's why we were not able to specify something differently than boilers. Today, we wouldn't really consider boilers, so I would use something compact, uh, compact heat pump in the uh, upper floors. But that's what we had um, um, in that um, moment when we were specifying it. And the ventilation system is a centralized uh, MVHR, which I, I, I would like to emphasize in this point that it's not only about energy, it's we really need to make sure that indoor air quality, it's, um, it's appropriate and we, we, we do provide comfort um, living conditions. The last slide, in terms of users, we I think heat pumps and users, I, we, we can't underestimate the impact of uh, of how a user, or we can't underestimate what how a user is going to 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 operate the systems, and we can't underestimate the level of knowledge and what uh, um, average Scottish um, person or or resident uh, and, uh, knows about ASOC pump. So I would assume they don't know anything, and I would assume that. They might not understand uh, that they have to do a minimum amount of things. And that also includes people in the housing associations. Main uh, information regarding maintenance or the minimum things that they have to do for every system needs to be um, explained to them in uh, with a quick start guide, um, but also in different situations um, during the, the first years that they use this. Um, uh, properties after being retrofitted. So we prepared we prepared this in for Nature Road, but we also prepared this for uh, most of our retrofit projects, uh, and it provides very simple um, guidelines on how to operate systems, active and passive, efficiently. And the last thing we are going to do, and we already are doing POE for for this project, so we will know how the building actually works in reality and will hopefully be able to share the findings soon. The project is now um, uh, about to, uh, we are reaching completion. We are testing it for the last time, hopefully today. So uh, it will be occupied soon. So that's uh, my last slide and thanks very much. Hope that was, um, you, if, if you have any questions, please drop me an email. You have my details here, but I can also pick up questions later on. Thank you so much, Barbara. That was excellent. Um, yep, we're still waiting for questions to come up, but what we're going to do um, first is a quick poll. Um, just to check 
what people think about heat pumps for their own house. If where you live was largely efficient, funds were available to you, and the decision was yours, would you consider installing a heat pump into your own house? Yes, no, don't know enough yet, or already got one. Um, I live in a tenement flat, so um, unfortunately we have considerations with all of the other tenants. Um, however, it is something that um, you know I've been thinking about um, how we get involved, how we can speak to everybody else that's that's in the the close. So I'm just waiting for the results to come up. Great. So around 60% of us would consider it. That's excellent. Um, yeah, we've got quite a, a small percentage of those. Fantastic. Um, and I think we do have one person that has one um, in their house that we're going to hear from, uh, hopefully, in the question and answer session. That's that's great. Thanks, guys. Um, I'd now like to introduce Dan Gates from Luths Services. Dan's an independent building services engineer. Um, he's been got a background in low uh, in renewables and low carbon heating with consulting and contracting services for the last 18 years. He has delivered over a thousand heat pump projects with a wide range of clients from self builders, SMEs, um, large house builders, and the largest commercial and industrial projects as well. He's a member of the Chartered Institute of Building Services, a member of Scottish Renewables, the Heat Pump Federation. He's an approved certifier of design for the Scottish Government, a qualified energy assessor, certified expert in building physics, and a low carbon consultant with SIBSI. So he has got an amazing breadth um, of knowledge. Um, he's worked on lots of different projects. So really looking forward to hearing from Dan. Thank you. Thanks, Sarah. Um, hopefully everyone can hear me. Um, my name's Dan Gates. I'm an engineer based in Glasgow and I work with my own company, Loose Services. Uh, Loose Services, we do building services, but sustainable, so we don't work on oil and gas projects. So most of the days, last uh, last three or four years, have been heat pumps, and before that, we went through all the stuff with biomass and things like that. These are some of the projects that we've worked on. Uh, so there's a small passive house one in Dundee. So we go from uh, high-end houses with uh, very small heat pumps. This is a 50 house development. We're doing them in E4 in Highland Council. That's all air source heat pumps. This is a 150 house retrofit project in Manchester, <coughs> which will either be ground source uh, or individual air source heat pumps. So we're just working through the retrofit stuff for that at the moment. This one is Plymouth University. So that's one of England's largest public sector heat pump projects. Uh, and that's ground source. Um, so that's a project we looked at last year with Kenza. Um, there's a new project that we're doing in Fife with a swimming pool and a ground source heat pump. And what I'm finding more and more is clients are actually, this client here is going for heat pump on that project because uh, they don't want to have gas boilers, even though the gas boiler would be the most economic for them in today's funding. Um, that's one of my engineers in Edinburgh last week doing a retrofit assessment. So it's exactly like uh, Barbara was saying, the tricky bit is actually retrofit where you're not actually sure what the fabric is and the air tightness and things like that. So we try and get in and measure things if we're unsure. I think we've mentioned, we had a chat before and some of the heat pump experience has not been good. And it is fair to say that no one really hears about the good ones. Um, but that's just a selection of comments that I've pulled off my social media, my Facebook. Um, but if you look at any one of those comments, it's really not about the heat pump or the box. It's mainly around the selling of the system, the design of the system or the commissioning. Uh, but the heat pump will get the, the bad name or the particular manufacturer will be told that it's bad. So the, some of the experience out there, we've got to be fair, wasn't good. Some of the first wave of heat pump projects, maybe six to eight years ago, the technology wasn't as good. Uh, so I'm going to go through that. That's a, a heat pump uh, installer course. Apologies, it's all men on there, but it still tends to be in the, in the heating industry, although there's more female engineers coming through. Uh, but even there, the, these guys here, um, they were just saying it's either not for them or they think it's for new builds. So their experience on retrofit is, um, hasn't been good either. Uh, that's my heat pump there. So I live in a typical council property, I would say, uh, in Glasgow. 
I put that heat pump in three years ago. I've got microbore pipe work and undersized radiators and didn't really save any money against the gas boiler, but it is possible to do it. And um, we have got it working. So in my talk, I really want to go through why heat pump performance might be improving compared to your experience over the last um, maybe eight to 10 years ago, the first heat pump started to come into Scotland. So I think the technology itself is improving. The, we're getting better practice in system design. So this is exactly as Barbara's saying, the whole looking at the whole house, looking at the heat loads and looking at the whole system design and the radiators and pipes and stuff. And there's now more technology and selection of heat pump and flexibility. So I'll go through both scenarios I think we can use heat pumps in. Things that have been the same, I think, are the supply chain skills. So I think the installer base is pretty high skilled in Scotland um, and qualified, but they tend to, you know, in the old days, you could lump a heating system just to an installer and um, they would then carry the can for everything else. And they're not necessarily the best at maybe designing and the commissioning and stuff. So I think it's been a bit unfair. So just going on to the technology, the the three things that I can identify easily for technology improvements are refrigerant development, inverter technology and control improvements. So that even in the last uh, two years, there's been new developments in refrigerants and refrigerant, you're going to hear from Dave next, um, the refrigerant engineers, bridge engineers are very intelligent. So it's not that refrigerants were bad before, it's just that engineers used to select possibly the safest ones. So very very safe, non-flammable refrigerants. In the last five to two years, we've moved through a transition to potentially accepting more flammability, a slight increase in flammability in refrigerants, but increased environmental performance. So we've reduced the global, war global warming potential dramatically and uh, with the latest chemicals in, in uh, heat pumps, we've got high, higher performance, higher efficiency and higher flow temperatures. So there's been a sort of engineering move to, to new refrigerants. Inverter technology, so it's fair to say six to eight years ago, if you were a purist, you would select your heat pump to, to run direct with a fixed speed motor. So it just meant that it would run at the, the peak capacity all the time, um, which is an efficient way to run it. But you have to then match that to your heat load exactly. So the trick at that point was to, to match it to 80, 90% of the heat load and then do 10% uh, top up with a backup boiler or a, an electrical heater. And on the continent, uh, they would call that an economic solution. Um, but these days, I think uh, the industry's accepted that if we size a heat pump for 100% of heat load, we're maybe oversizing it a bit. But if you have an inverter, you can scale and modulate the heat load uh, up and down so that they can cover the load efficiently. So with most technology now is uh, inverter driven and that's fairly common in projects these days. And then the last thing is probably control improvements. So we're seeing uh, six to eight years, 10 years ago, the very most expensive heat pumps would have the best controls and weather compensation and things like that. Um, or heat pumps used to do defrost with um, electrical heater strips and the fan units outside and that would reduce efficiency, but now most heat pumps are reversing and taking uh, hot water from inside the property and not, not using electrical backup for defrost. So there's a lot of things around controls that are now common that's moving through into even cheap heat pumps. The graph on the right is, uh, I'll spend a, a minute on this if that's okay, that's uh, heat pump performance from our records for the last five years, so 2016 on the left-hand side, and I'm plotting efficiency on the on the y-axis. So the COP is the efficiency. Um, it's really an SPF rather than a, a COP for the purists amongst you. But the COP is the the uh, we can take it as an efficiency. So two would be 200% um, efficient, and four would be 400% efficient in in simple terms. And then I've got plotted different heat pump projects by different flow temperatures. So as Barbara said, flow temperature is super critical. So the high, the higher the heat pumps can do high flow temperatures, but they have to work a bit harder. So if they're working a bit harder, they tend to be not as efficient. 
so the top one there is uh, 35 degrees, so that light blue line at the top um, is 35 degrees, so that would be an underflow heating system. You can deliver good heat to properties with underflow. That's quite hard to do in retrofit, so you probably have radiators in retrofit, and that would be a really good system. We would be designing our systems for retrofit for 45, so that would be that yellow line there. And then the dark blue line is 55 degree flow temperature. Um, and then I've taken 55 degree projects in orange and I've put the control improvements in and you can see, uh, sorry, taking the good control improvements, the weather compact systems, so systems that were just set up uh, without the best controls. And then the final line is the gray line. So that is 55 degree flow temperatures, but with bad uh, radiator design. So essentially they're running at high efficiency and uh, sorry, low efficiency and, and uh, a, poor, a poor COP. So the technology itself, although you can see a general trend in each of these scenarios for the COPs improving over the last five years, the single biggest change, if we take that 55 degree in 2021, you could have a COP of 3.1 or 3.2 there. Uh, but if you don't put the good controls in, it drops to three. And if you put the uh, the wrong emitters in, or you're not, uh, you haven't got your system design right, the COP is dropping down to 2.3. So it does the biggest single change is really in the in the designer's choice of flow temperature and radiators. The other thing that I think is improving is what I call operational improvements. It's nothing to do with technology. It's just People are getting better at designing heat pump systems. The message about lower flow temperatures is going out, which means that you can't just pick standard radiators from Screwfix and use the heat output. So we have to do design calcs. So the emitter design is, is definitely uh, the biggest factor in, in successful projects. Calculating heat loss is getting a lot better and the methodology and, and uh, the discipline of commercial heat loss calculations are coming into domestic projects and I'll, I'll show you an example of that in a minute and then what I call independent commissioning so this is exactly as Barbara said it's setting up at the end if you set a heat pump up and don't and and don't set the controls right it's just going to run all the time or use a backup heater and the efficiency and the bills will will be bad for the client and so a lot of uh, commissioning is probably happening on a Friday night uh, with the that's left to the apprentice and the junior plumber they probably would set it up to 50, 55 degrees because they want to see all the heat move through and the radiators get hot and the client wants to see the, the heat generated. They'll probably leave the hot water on 24 seven because again, the customer wants to see hot water and the, the plumber doesn't want the call back on Saturday. So uh, unless that's factored in for them to come back on Monday and start playing around with heat curves and anyone who's got their own heat pump You'd probably be fair to say you need two to three uh, commissionings um, over a month or even maybe come back over a winter and try and tweak it to get optimum performance and that's not always factored into cost sensitive projects. The graph on the right is actually for gas central heating or for, for fossil fuel systems and that's from the domestic heating design guide and so it's not for heat pumps but if you take the blue line there that's the uh, return temperatures that are needed to to give uh, efficiency. So as you, uh, on the right hand side, most gas boilers are sent up with a return temperature around about 60 and a flow of 70. But the curve there, once it gets to that 55 degree mark on the return temperature, the, the actual boiler can start condensing. So you need a you need a return temperature to be under 55 degrees with gas before the boiler starts condensing. The red dot is where my SAP uh, calculation, or I'm told in SAP that I need to put gas central heating in at 93%. And it's fair to say, I don't think most systems in the last 20 years have been designed for uh, low return temperatures, low flow temperatures. So a lot of heat pump projects are trying to rectify the mistake of not designing uh, radiators and, and the distribution correct in the first place. So I'll just move through. This is the first of four scenarios that I can see in heat pump development. 
Uh, scenario one is like Barbara said, if you can get in and do the fabric stuff or you're working on passive house, uh, you could do an individual little heat pump. Uh, this is only really if you can get the heat load under two kilowatts, I would say, maybe three kilowatts as a max for space heating. In that case, you can have a small heat pump. There's, that's the heat pump on the left there doing the hot water. You have to watch because it's um, potentially you're going to be interacting with the ventilation and heat load on that small in a retrofit. You would um, probably have an MVHR system. So it's not that simple to, to, to balance it all, but it does work. Um, the next scenario is one that we're quite familiar with, which is individual air source. Uh, terrace properties here, fairly low heat loads and individual heat pumps on the front of the properties. I'd say even eight years ago, you probably couldn't do that because the noise levels, you'd need to be six to eight meters away from bedroom windows. But these days, heat pump technology could probably get those units within two to three meters, uh, maybe under two meters on the best units and still be quiet, even in a rural setting. This is a project we're looking at for 27 properties in Preston. And this is just to emphasize the heat loss calculations. So if we can get in and do full heat loss calcs, get paid to do it. Uh, this is 20, 27 properties. Uh, that would normally be 28 kilowatt gas boilers. But with the heat loss modeling, we can show an annual profile here with it peaking at sort of eight kilowatts. Um, if we can get the, the profiles down to half hourly modeling of heat loads, we can size thermal stores. So the result here is we're putting five kilowatt heat pumps in with uh, thermal stores, which will allow for flexible tariffs, time of use tariffs, much less plant. Um, so I think that's the advantage of doing heat loss calcs, which makes sense if you've got 27 properties. So the cost of us doing analysis is saved by not buying large heat pumps. This is the, the sort of New scenario, which is tenements or terrace properties, you're not going to put air source heat pumps up on blocks of flats all the way up. Uh, so this is what we're, uh, we're adopting from the continent, these shared ambient loops. Uh, so the ground source people are, are really moving in on this. Um, so you run a ambient loop or a, a heat network at 10, maybe to 20 degrees. Uh, you have an individual heat pump in each flat and then the the brine loop or that is normally recharged from a ground source loop. Each resident then has a single heat pump in their property and they're responsible for their own bill, um, much as if they were just on electric heating. Half the time they don't even realize they have a heat pump in the property. This is uh, Ken's project from Grampian. So that's, uh, that's uh, yeah, 23 apartments with uh, 10 boreholes. That's inside the residence um, uh, cupboard. So the heat pumps in the bottom and the cylinders on the top. You could potentially put a phase change solid uh, cylinder in there and reduce that size down by half again. Uh, but yeah, there is there is space requirements. But um, an, an alternative take on that is um, ambient loop for uh, heat network in, in Glasgow that we're working on with Rose Hill housing at the moment. In this case, um, we're putting the ambient loop in and a little mini heat pump into each property. This is actually with John Gilbert's, uh, with Barbara's practice. Um, so we're stripping all the gas central heating out of the apartments. And then we have a small gas boiler in the basement heating a, a buffer tank. And that will raise that tank to 15 degrees, so minimal amount of gas. Um, the, it's just because we can't afford to do the full borehole system that you would normally have with this system in the current grant funding regime. Um, but it does give the option to then come along and either replace that gas boiler in five years or 10 years with an air source or a ground source loop, or we can top that up with solar thermal, or potentially they'll start driving heat networks around Glasgow and we can connect in. But so we're essentially making the, the properties net zero ready now, rather than waiting 10 years for heat networks. The f final scenario I won't go on too long is just ultra dense urban, I call it. And this is what Dave will, will be going through with heat networks. Essentially, if you can get enough density in your, your, in your heat demand, it justifies a central heat pump, a plant room. 
in this case you can run it in high temperature so you've got the energy center and you're running heat networks out to different properties maybe an anchor load property or a block of flats um, the graph on the right so this is a retrofit scenario the heat loss for each property is 12.5 kilowatts so on the left hand side you can see the number of properties so uh, the blue line is the design and the green is what it's actually measured on site uh, so if you take 12.5 kilowatt heat loads for all the apartments but then you add them all to a network you get this diversity factor they call it so by the time you get to 150 customers um, essentially you only need 2.8 kilowatts per customer rather than the 12.5 if you had individual heat sources so in this scenario individual boilers you would need close to two megawatts of heat boilers one 1875 kilowatts of heat or you can put a heat network in with something like dave's central heat pump uh, start from star uh, and you can fit a plant room with 375 kilowatt heat pump so you're saving a lot in plant but you do need this density uh, to, to make it work this I won't go on about heat networks, but uh, the kind of stuff that we do is the internal uh, thing. So if you went out and did a heat network with a contractor, they would probably just want one riser. So the, the picture on the bottom, there's uh, uh, three scenarios there. So the top one, there's a central riser coming up through the lift shaft and then long lateral flows to the heat interface units, the little red boxes in the flats. That's the cheapest one for the contractor to fit, but it's the one potentially with most heat loss. Uh, the middle one is better, so one riser and short laterals, and then HIUs, so the heat interface units uh, relocated. So the contractor might not like that because you might have to make cupboards or something like that, but uh, it does re definitely reduce the heat loss probably by 10%. Uh, and the final one's the best. So we've actually, that's with two risers, so you've got it split left and right very uh, literally no laterals and uh, the heat interface unit's really tight so that's the minimum amount of heat loss most amount of capital cost but if you did a 20-year operational uh, cash flow on that that would be the best option um, just to finish that's a uh, air source heat pump um, high temperature network with air source so that's this is North Glasgow's project um, so they've got the heat pumps, uh, the blocks of flats, and they've got the heat pumps on the top. So there's a picture of the heat pump uh, evaporator fan units on the top of the, the properties. It's amazing if you can get up there, you get the best view. You can see the picture on the right, there's the, the heat pumps just sitting on the top and, the, and, a, and a plant room. Uh, the HIU units, these heat interface units are, are there in the, uh, the black box in the middle. And then there's a picture of the living room. That's a that's a radiator size for a uh, for heat pump project, sized at 50 degree flow. So it's not excessive radiators. It's maybe just bigger than you might get normally, but not excessively big. And then the picture on the right is the risers that they put all through the property. But they were doing this uh, project in the same time as retrofitting for. Um, fire safety and putting the sprinkler systems in. So you can see the sprinkler system and the, the risers for that at the same time, which they were, so they took the opportunity to put a, a heat network through the properties while they were doing fireworks. So just finishing up, there is funding and I think uh, Best can send you an email or, or Sarah if you want. Um, it is possible, it's, it is complex and we, we all live in a funding environment, but basically, with these kind of mechanisms and Scottish government are keen, um, it is possible to deliver heat pump projects for the same cost or even less than fossil fuel systems. Um, so in conclusion, I think hey, heat, pump, heat pump technology is definitely improving. Heat pump operational issues are improving and that's really coming down to good designers, system designers and the, the supply chain upskilling. And there is a flexibility selection. I would say that there's no one right one. You know, there's no one size fits all solution. And in any renewable project, you probably have to compromise on something, whether that's fitting a cylinder or, or something like that. Um, but hopefully, that's given you a taste of uh, where we. I think we are with heat pumps in Scotland at the moment. Thank you. 
That was fantastic, Dan. Yeah, that's given us a really good idea. Lots of different examples there of the types of properties um, that you're working on. Um, I found particularly the, the kind of future proofing, so some properties will probably have a backup, which can be then joined into a network as and when um, when they get developed across Glasgow. So really great. And I will send out all the funding information that was mentioned there. And again, you know, if you've got anything that's been mentioned today that you want to find out about in more detail, you can get in touch. So we're going to have another poll. Um, and this is kind of looking at what people think um, are the most important considerations for heat pumps. So um, is it fabric improvement? Um, we've heard a lot today about tenant engagement, um, the design of the system, and of course, um, how the system um, is installed. So it's just to get a sense of um, what people think. Obviously, putting in all of this new technology, you need to make sure that people, particularly vulnerable residents, are comfortable using it. Um, and I think as well, pre doing any kind of retrofit project, again, tenant engagement is absolutely key um, to get the community um, that you're operating in bought into it. Um, so yeah, just waiting for the results to come up. Yeah, absolutely. Fabric first approach um, is coming out uh, very high. Um, and of course, design. Um, but yeah, I think we all realise that you know heat pumps need to go into properties that are energy efficient. And so that is that is the first step model what you have, um, work on the fabric first. Um, fantastic, thanks. Um, so now I'd like to introduce our third speaker. Um, we have Dave Pearson from Star Refrigeration. Um, he's a graduate in mechanical engineering with an MBA. He's been working uh, within Star Refrigeration Group since 1990. He is the Group Sustainable Development Director. His technical and commercial awareness uh, within the industrial heat pump market um, led to the successful deployment of the world's largest district heating system in Norway. Um, David is a recipient of many industry awards, including the Jai Hall Gold Medal, and he is the chairman of SEED. So uh, we're delighted to have him uh, join us as well. Over to you, Dave. Thanks, Sarah. Can you see my slides okay? Yes, we can. Thank you. Super. Thanks. Well, good morning, everybody. Um, it's, it's a pleasure uh, almost to be with you, certainly uh, online, and even more so a pleasure to speak after Barbara and Dan, who really teed this up. Uh, very well. Uh, I suppose the analogy I would, I would give is what's better, a teaspoon or a shovel? Um, you know, both kind of do the same thing, but it really depends what you're trying to do. Trying to do. Um, my uh, slightly cold uh, cup of coffee here, I don't think I would get very far trying to stir it with a shovel, so it isn't always uh, big is better. Um, and so heat pumps do come in all shapes and sizes. My job is to, to maybe uh, take you on this uh, last pathway, the final pathway, it almost sounds like some sort of Bruce Willis uh, movie or something. But uh, what, we'll, what we find is, um, this isn't going to go away, this isn't, this isn't a fad about moving away from burning gas. There's lots of reasons that we started the journey and there's lots of, lots of reasons that it will keep going. But if you just look across, uh, pinch this uh, graphic from the European Heat Pump Association, but all of these, um, if we did a poll, which was more important? Uh, frankly, all of them. Is it is it about clean air? You know, it's it's the it's the pandemic we don't talk about. Um, supply security, very topical. Uh, but local jobs, you know, building back better, you know, get, getting people into high quality jobs. But also smart grids as we try and decarbonise our electricity system. That is much more variable than it was. And if we can have lots of devices that could maybe switch on and off uh, to to try and help balance the grid, that's definitely a good thing. So this isn't going to go away. Uh, the question is how best to to, to press forward and, and uh, really take the front foot and and not get bullied into doing things uh, either the wrong thing or at the wrong time. But heat is it's still the Cinderella of the energy system. Um, I, I'm a member of quite a few different associations, but none of them really are, are putting the emphasis I think that's that's required in this uh, because it's the single largest reason for burning gas. Uh, which is and, and burning methane is the single largest contributing factor to to climate change. So it's it's really all about heat. Um, we've we've uh, particularly in Scotland done a lot with uh, decarbonising electricity. Transport's coming along, uh, but we're not really getting enough. If if the amount of column inches, if we if anybody still reads a real newspaper, um, or or may, maybe it might be Facebook posts these days, if it, if it was in proportion to the size of the challenge you would see a lot more about, about the heat pumps. But of course, society is very broad and different um, different places. Uh, 
quick quiz round the wheel here. Everything from industrial uses, uh, the tenement flats that were mentioned earlier, to high density city centre areas, new bits of cities. The cities are all on a, on a bit of a building programme at the moment. I've never seen so many cranes in Glasgow. And um, to new build stuff, and um, one would argue that that's possibly the easy bit, and we should just uh, do it. Uh, let's not get too too uh, wound up by it. And and there's low density domestic uh, properties as well. And there's several other pieces that could fit in this, uh, maybe more suited to to social housing uh, blocks of flats and so on. But um, you know the challenge is picking the right solution for each of these. But there is there is a solution for all of them. Even the 160 degree Industrial heat pumps are now emerging uh, for for doing distilleries and, and and such like, or or drying pet food, or or making starch or whatever. The the world around us is moving forwards from burning gas just to heat stuff up. So what does a heat pump look like? Um, it's it's in my mind it, it it might be a little box, it might be a big big box, but it's actually this Venn diagram. You've got to have a heat source. What are you going to get the heat from? A heat pump doesn't magic heat from nowhere. It has to pull it from one place and push it to another. Um, you need the tech that comes in all shapes and sizes. The heat demand quite clearly uh, needs to be in the right place at the right time and, and well understood. And uh, as small as possible is, is a very strong message that comes through twice already. And I certainly echo that. But also you have to think about the economics uh, of that piece. And that's a, that's a real big challenge at the moment because I don't think we're getting the, the central policy that really recognises if we're going to try and electrify things, let's think about the, the way that we price electricity. Um, we're making electricity on a hill outside Glasgow for five pence, but people buying it two miles down the road are expected to pay 15, 20, 25, 30 pence for it, maybe even 35. That's all bits of paper and policy, and that's that's going to have to change. So, big heat pumps, what have we done? Well, this is a quick uh, flyby uh, down at Queen's Quay and Clyde Bank. Uh, the building on the left is the heat pump energy centre. Uh, that will be capable for about uh, the equivalent of 10 to 15,000 homes if that's what was being built, but it's a, a mixture of different stuff. Inside, uh, the heat pumps supplied by Star, uh, made in Glasgow and Thorley Bank, uh, deployed by Vital Energy uh, for our client, Western Bartonshire Council. So the point of this is really just to, to say it, they do come in all shapes and sizes. It's not just something that looks similar, but a slightly bigger uh, box. They, they really are on an industrial scale. And there's a slightly easier uh, picture. And they've really tried to make the, make the, the community proud of it and, and uh, lights up at night and looks great and all the rest of it. But what's the key thing about Queen's Key? Why, why is it special? Well, it delivers heat at 80 degrees C. With the best will in the world, there are going to be some buildings that we just can't uh, fabric first all the way down to 45 degrees, for example. Or it might be the town hall or it might be the Jubilee Hospital or the, the, the college that was nearby. We have to decarbonize all of society. Uh, and perhaps that means, um, in, in some cases, uh, going in a more collaborative approach. But on this site, there are new new buildings, and these are the flats for the Wheatley Group, and they don't have gas, they've, they don't have heat pumps in them at all, they've got an individual heat interface unit. And that's, broadly speaking, about the same size as a boiler. It doesn't need a hot water storage tank, it's got, uh, it's got a twin plate, it's got one plate for making hot water, uh, direct, a bit like a combi boiler, you turn it on, the water comes in cold and immediately comes out warm, and it's got a second plate for the radiators. And this this can can operate uh, anything down to uh, probably about 60 degrees, 55 degrees even perhaps. In this case, the scheme is operating mainly about 75, and we're always trying to keep the temperature as low as possible. It's basically about uh, observing and monitoring which is the worst building and keeping the temperature only warm enough just for that, and not just banging the temperature up a little bit like what Dan was saying about the commissioning. You can't just switch it on to full max and, and run away on a Friday evening. So lots of controls, but this this uh, heat interface unit is really compact and that works really well for the flats, whether they're new or old. So the question is, is this going to be repeated and what should you as um, housing associations uh, be thinking about and planning about? It will come down to heat offtake surety and there's definitely uh, strong moves both in the Scottish government and the UK government um, to decarbonise heat. Um, heat might be a, a policy uh, aspect that's been devolved to the Scottish government, but actually it's more complicated than that because energy is a reserve matter. So anything to do with, uh, if you like, people uh, or businesses' right to burn gas 
is really quite uh, controlled in Westminster at the moment. That's creating a bit of a bit of a tension with the Scottish government as to how do they decarbonise heat if they can't do things to make gas a little bit harder. But the message is very clear: north and south buildings must decarbonise. It is going to happen. Uh, we're kind of limbering up a little bit slowly at the moment, in my view, but it's definitely going to happen. So so get ready for it. The second bit is electricity cost. And I mentioned this earlier. We're now beginning to see people think about electrification, what that means as a, a wider society. So the UK is priced on a single zone. And what that basically means is there's one price for electricity across the entire country. Yes, you can buy it from different people. And yes, you might get a slightly different tariff. But broadly speaking, if it's 20 pence per kilowatt hour in London, it's 20 pence per kilowatt hour in Glasgow. And that makes it really difficult uh, to try and decarbonise, because as I already said, that's a, a quite inflated cost, way above what we call the the um, the commodity cost, which is round about 5 pence per kilowatt hour. And the policy costs are, are adding uh, another 300% above that. And that, that's now being looked at and thinking about changing it, and thinking about, well, if I'm close to a wind farm and it's windy, surely electricity should be cheaper. And trying to get in amongst that and there's been a couple of uh, moves uh, from some of the utility providers but they're actually a little bit contrived a little bit fake at the moment uh, personally i've got a heat pump through the door behind me in my garage and i buy as much electricity as i can at night time when i've got a nighttime tariff and daytime i try and use a, as little as possible and i'm getting an average broadly speaking just above halfway in between the two um, so that's definitely a little bit of a uh, time shifting and think about the way that you you run things, but we're going to see more structural change in this. There's already uh, consultations from government about how we're going to price for electricity. But what I'd like to see is that people don't go down the route of um, private wire. You know, build your own wind turbine to to supply areas of cities. I think that's creating a parallel grid that's probably not in society's best interest. I'd like to see that we we think about electricity a little bit smarter. So both of these are happening, and that means that heat pumps will happen more and the buildings need to be ready for it. So what should a social housing operator do? Well, uh, three bits really for me. The first is understand the stock. And that's right back to the beginning when Barbara was talking about uh, ex what exactly have you got? You really need to understand what you've got and where you can get to and how best to do that. But the reality is you'll never get the heat demand to zero in a lot of these buildings, particularly if it's um, uh, traditional tenement buildings, particularly if, if um, you know, we've got to do such a large, large quantity. But we, we are learning how, how best to do it. Personally, I found uh, in my house, draft proofing was every bit as important as insulation. And that, that was a really important bit for, for getting the heat demand down. So getting to that point where what amount of heat do you actually need? The second bit is demand support. The local authorities are all doing a, a scheme at the moment called ELGIS. It's the Local Heat Energy Efficiency Strategy. And that's basically plotting out on each of the cities how different bits of the cities will be done so get involved with that uh, push them find out what they're doing uh, eyeball the plans uh, critique the plans and, and and work out where you fit fit into that and, but ultimately if you've got big junky buildings and there's lots of them and they're quite tightly packed around other buildings then perhaps it's a district heating network and so what you really want to be making sure is that uh, somebody is planning to bring district heating to your to your patch because the last thing I think we want to be doing is trying to uh, fix individual buildings all in isolation of each other. That's probably not the right way to go. So be collaborative. Um, you might be a local housing uh, association, but there might be a school next to you. Talk to them. Say to them, look, you know, this is coming our way. Let's get together and make sure we don't get bullied by the by the cities or are forced to do something at short notice. When really, you know, you, you sh what you should be doing is, um, uh, and we, we detail a lot more detail here at uh, a, a short website we put up called Fairopoly, but buildings should basically be saying, I will take district heating uh, if that's the right thing for me. Cities should be saying, I will contrive to bring district heating to you. And developers should be saying, well, if you create the demand for district heating and we sort out the economics, we've got a business model here. We'll, we'll, we'll join the two gaps together and create it. So it's a bit of a sandwich, uh, conscious as last speakers, maybe not you know, a bit early for lunch today, um, or 11s as it might be, but it's a sandwich. It's all about getting the fabric and heat demand right. And it's all about thinking about the electricity costs as you're going forward. If you do do your own projects, PV is great. If there's any any prospect of doing uh, any other um, electricity generation of, of any any sort at all, that's, that's a great thing to do. But 
pick fairly early on what you're going to do about the heat pump. Are you going to do stuff for individual properties? Are you going to do something shared for a few properties? Or are you going to really uh, set your stall out and say, we're part of a, a wider community here um, and a, a dense urban area. It's really right that we, we make sure we're first in the queue for saying, yes, please, I'll, I'll have some of that. There are very few buildings that won't suit a heat pump. Uh, quick uh, Google image here, I found one, but that must be about one of the few uh, that, that doesn't doesn't work for it. So I hope that's been helpful. Uh, be delighted to hear from any of you. Uh, I think there's questions uh, coming up. My email address is there if anybody wants to to contact me. But um, don't don't be scared. Um, there's there's lots of good learnings going on that we can all uh, share and help each other with. Absolutely. Thanks, Dave. That was excellent. Um, some really good uh, points about electricity and um, the fact that we need to change the pricing structure. And we're just going to do another quick poll and then we'll move on to the question and answer session. So what are the biggest challenge for local authorities um, to deliver large scale retrofit projects? Um, is it access to funding? Is it adequately trained staff um, in PAS or retrofit? Do we need to think about the supply chain for heat pumps, MCS certification? There's a couple of questions that have come through about that, which we'll get to. And of course, tenant engagement. So what are your thoughts? Um, where do you think the biggest challenges lie um, within the local authorities? Um, just wait for the results to come through um, and then we'll move on to questions and answers. We've got some fab questions that came through. Yeah, so a bit of a mix. Um, I had asked a question about PAS 2035, but we can come on to that. Yeah, funding. I think everyone has identified there's been a massive underestimation um, from, um, from funding mechanisms about the amount of money that we're going to need to be able to deliver this challenge. Um, so, yeah, and 50% again coming up for tenant engagement. Fabulous. OK, so I think we're just going to wait for um, all the speakers and um, Tony just to um, unmute and come back on camera. And then we'll move on to questions and answers. Um, let's see. Is everyone, everyone speak, say hi. Hello. Yep, great, Fab. Okay, so I don't know if Tony's still with us. Um, I don't know he was having some technical issues earlier on, but we'll go to the first question and answer session. So, panel, what do we think? Why are new build properties still getting gas boilers installed? And when will this be phased out? And I do think there's some legislation coming through in 25. Yes, Dan? I think the uh, simplest thing would be to revise SAP, because I have SAP assessor, so the, the whole energy performance and compliance is biased to gas central heating. And we've been asking for a revision in SAP for five years. You could sort it now, essentially, and uh, there's consultations and things going through. And but as soon as they do that, the better. The 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 big house builder, most of the house builders are, you know, voluntarily. Uh, Caller are saying they're not fitting gas boilers. You know, even they're not waiting for legislation. So the whole industry is ready, and it's so easy to do new new build now that yeah, government's just been a bit slow. Yep, Dave. I, I mean, I despair about this. It's the easiest bit. And uh, frankly, even the 2025, that will be the application uh, for a building warrant. And you have three years to build your property and you could probably get an extension. So the, the, the sneaky, let's not assume they're all sneaky or dishonest, but the sneaky would uh, still be putting gas boilers in new buildings in 2028, 2029. Uh, I absolutely despair that we can't even do the easy stuff. Um, it's, it's frankly not good enough. Why it is, I, I really don't know, because I've been in this space for 10 years and people have been saying for 10 years, why do we keep building stuff with uh, gas boilers in it? So, um, wakey, wakey, somebody, I don't know who, but somebody needs to wake up. Okay, um, thanks for that. Um, Tony, hi, thanks for joining us. Is your, um, can you say hi so I can see if you're, we can hear you? Um, still on mute, Tony. Tony, I think you've changed your audio settings. If you just go up to audio and make sure that it's connected to the right headset. 
Uh, I'll just go over a quick question while Tony's um, getting himself um, sorted. Um, is there funding available to retrain domas domestic gas engineers in heat pump technology installation? Quick answer to that is yes. Um, there's been grants um, that you can apply for um, through Scottish Government. Um, I believe it's coming to an end, but I will send that link out um, for anyone that wants to pass that information on. Um, there are grants to get through the certification process with MCS. Um, I was at a presentation with them a couple of months ago, and I'll seek that link out and make sure everyone's got access to the grant funding. Okay, just a point here from one of the audience members. Um, so the pricing for electric was established in the 80s. It was based on the last unit of production determining the price. Um, pretty mad, but does it lead? It does lead to the continuity of supply as well. Um, Octopus are pushing local pricing networks as an as an alternative option. Now that's not something that I know about, but I'm just anyone else want to take that on? I think you kind of touched on that, Dave. Yeah, and and they're absolutely right. You know, we, we've we've gone from 60 power stations to 60,000, uh, and and they they sometimes get described as um, intermittent or interruptible, which is absolutely right. The thing about uh, dynamic consumption of electricity is you can you can phase it up and you can phase it down. And the first thing I'd point out is the demand for heat tends to be higher when it's windier. So actually, when we've got less of this clean electricity, we probably have less demand for that for the heating systems. The second is certainly somewhere like Queen's Quay, and I, I, I can't really speak for, for smaller domestic properties, but somewhere like Queen's Quay, if there was absolutely zero wind-generated electricity, we could jump onto the backup. And at the moment, the backup is gas, but that backup could be something else in the future. We've got a thermal store, so we've got about two hours worth of heat just in a simple big hot water tank. So there's lots of ways that you can make facilities really, really flexible. So we need to stop saying you can't and start saying how will we, uh, because it's absolutely crazy that on a really windy day that somewhere like Whiteley's wind farm is curtailed and not generating electricity just because there's not enough customers electricity in a really windy day it's just nuts but that's the way the policy is written and and you know that's going to take a bit of change and if we stop talking about price caps and all the other stuff that get the headlines and start getting into the nuts and bolts of energy policy i think we'll come up with something a little bit smarter because what we've got is really pretty dumb at the moment to be perfectly honest thank you tony are you how are you getting I'm, I'm, I'm there now yeah you're back <laughs> My incompetence with the hardware, as it, as it turns no, out. No, not at all. Um, we've, I think we've all suffered from tech issues in this new world that we're all operating in. Um, not at all. Um, yeah, so Tony, do you have any, any questions or comments, insights um, that you'd like to bring to the discussion? I, 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 well, one of my... Dead... I suppose one of my most regular observations is around the timing of the whole process. So on the assumption that, <clears throat> that we can resolve the issues with, with heat pumps and other technologies, and, and Look at the, the stuff that you've been saying out there has been really, really interesting, and it certainly gives me a, a little bit more confidence and a bit more understanding about how these things work and how you combine them with other technologies. I think there is still a need for a substantial national commitment around heat networks and district heating. We just need to accept that there's a 30, 40 year program of, of developing a heat network system in particular, um, which is the way it's been done in other bits of Europe. It takes that long, but uh, to, to, to quote Tolkien, if you forgive me, uh, the job that takes the longest is the one that's never started. We absolutely have to start. Um, I think that was, um, what's his face? Um, anyway, Samwise, there you go. Sam Gamgee, that's a, that's a Sam Gamgee, one of his gaffers quotes anyway. Uh, so there is something about making a commitment and starting that work. But the other issue, I think, for the social housing sector, bearing in mind that we are not being offered any substantial uh, financial support at the moment, the unstated expectation is that all the costs of this work will fall on rents. The 1.8 billion the Scottish Government has put aside won't touch it, even in the local authority sector, never mind in the, the rest of the, the, the built environment. The UK Government has a number of programmes in place, but they aren't huge. And the, the, the conservative estimate, the kind of the least worst estimate in the local authority sector is 5 million. <clears throat> Doing that over 10 years is utter madness. Um, so the, the, one of the issues is a more sensible conversation about the timing of all this. There is no requirement for the social housing sector to decarbonise in 10 years. And I say that for two reasons. The first one is that 
the sector's done far more than any other part of the residential sector um, over the last 20 years and has spent huge sums of tenants' money, again, without any significant support from outside the, uh, the revenue account to achieve quite substantial improvements in housing, in stock condition and, and energy efficiency. We're not being offered any substantial support. If it costs £15,000 a house, and that's the conservative estimate, that's £5 billion. Our total capital investment in the last 10 years was £5 billion. So, and, you know, so we're, we're looking at a hard choice between new supply, between other investment priorities, things like uh, roofs and windows and uh, uh, bathrooms and kitchens, all of which still need to get done to, to keep the stock up to the Scottish Housing Quality Standard. Uh, we aren't going to do that in 10 years. It's as simple as that. Now, and the other, the other argument is, if you actually look at carbon emissions in Scotland, the social housing sector probably amounts to two to two and a half percent of all of Scotland's carbon emissions. It is in the roundings when it comes to the annual variations, if you look at the uh, uh, the published figures. We are not contributing uh, any significant measure. We have done more than most, and there are bigger, uh, more important areas like agriculture, like transport, like industry, uh, where there, is, there isn't a clear plan. They are not being told at their own expense to decarbonize. Tenants are, and there's a problem with that. So we aren't the, the issue. There is a job to get done, actually, the primary driver for us is fuel poverty. Primary driver for the sector isn't saving the planet. It's uh, supporting, uh, in, enabling tenants to live a decent life in the homes they have on the incomes that they have. Uh, and that's one of the major, the, the, a more immediate concern, if you'll forgive me, than, than decarbonisation. Being asked to do it in 10 years is wholly unreasonable. Uh, so 20 years, is which which would still square with the medium term uh, ambition to to reach zero carbon would be a much more sensible timescale. And it's a matter of having that conversation with the Scottish government, which we haven't yet been successful uh, in having. And we, we, you know, the other frustration at the moment, obviously, is we still don't have a response to the Zest report, which is now seven months since publication. Uh, we were hoping to get one fairly shortly after the um, local government elections, but it hasn't materialised yet, and we can't really move on until we get clear steer on where the Scottish Government wants to go with Zest, understand what the ish 2 review process is, is going to look like, and then get a proper conversation about investment capacity uh, across the social housing sector and what is acceptable in rent terms. And the Scottish Government has milked, frankly, uh, social housing to achieve, for example, particular targets in, uh, in additional social housing provision without any consideration of what that's doing to rents. In recent conversations that we had with them, they actually denied any connection between their investment ambitions and rent rises and pointed the finger very firmly back at social landlords and said, this is all your fault. Um, the very frustrating session that was, I can tell you. Um, we're only now getting to a position where officials are beginning to show an interest in what local authority housing finance looks like and what the implications for rent are. And we need to have a much more sensible conversation about those things. That was a speech, my apologies. <laughs> No, I think there are complications with 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 Esh coming out, and when um, there's also um, uh, building standards are going through a massive change, um, and you know they're different from the UK standards, and how do we you know square square that off? I, I was interested. We're, we are still what, building what, homes in the private sector that will need to be retrofitted, and that I mean that is just total madness. We're not building homes in the social sector that will need to be retrofitted, in, certainly in a fabric, uh, view, although gas boilers are still being installed. But we are still building homes, and that's most of the homes that are being built. We'll, we'll need, and we'll be doing that for the next five years, as things stand. And we're still building, uh, we are still retrofitting buildings that will need to be retrofitted. So, you know, it's, it's also that as well. Yep. Yeah, I agree. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and a point was raised to me actually last week um, about properties that um you know have insulation that has failed and, and how can we go in and fix that um uh, particularly around the kind of polystyrene beating you know it's really difficult to get out um mm -hmm. and obviously there's rural considerations as well what what do what does the panel think about um pas 2035 um and the adoption of that in the uk market uh, scottish market sorry cool. yeah um well, we were retrofit coordinators. I, I, I do think it's good to have the discipline, like Barbara said, of whole house approach. Because if you if you you tend to be doing uh, more air tightness, like Dave said as well, you know, you're draft proofing everything before you, and then that does just cause health problems if it's not done right. There's so many bad 
retrofit projects where you get mould after they've uh, sealed it up or put insulation in. So it is about health of buildings as well. And um, uh, my worry is that we went through stuff like that with Green Deal and things, and uh, you can you can get qualified big coordinators, and people are selling their service for like ninety pounds to do that, and there's a lot of work, and it's tick box rather than doing it properly. Absolutely, Barbara. Yeah, very. I will try to be brief. <laughs> we we have looked at this and and have I would say daily discussions about class twenty thirty five. I think the first thing that I would say is that it's overall good. I think the the state that retrofit the end, retrofit industry was years ago, or at least or still sometimes is, but was uh, two years ago was very very poor there were many many we have to remember there were so many reports highlighting the issues the performance gap issues issues with mold with dampness and everyone always blaming residents for not using things well not opening windows when there were massive thermal bridges bridges, bridges everywhere so that that's what how we were that was the scenario past 2035 tries to mitigate many of those issues. It's it's it, through the a holistic approach. How we are implementing it and a, how we're making sure that it's actually implemented in, in, in a robust way, a, I think that's another discussion. But I think overall it's very positive. There was a big issue and we had to deal with it and, and we are dealing with it. A, and I think past 2035, it's one of the, I, we believe it's one of the answers. We also work implement and other standards um, and we think there are other holistic standards that are, are trying to um, to look at a retrofit in the in, in that way but what past 2035 it's one of them and we have to find a way of making it work in Scotland for the Scottish uh, uh, properties environments for our um, lack of skills and and so on but I think it is possible and we have to train as many people as pos professionals possible to in order to make it work thank you Tony yeah yeah I, I mean a couple of observations I mean particularly one about what happens if you get it wrong I, 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 folk in the audience have heard me say this before if we get this wrong what happens is we impoverish hundreds of thousands of households both through their rent and through their heating costs we do substantial damage to the buildings that they're living in which we will then need to charge them to go and collect uh, and we will damage their health and shorten their lives in some instances so that the, the risks around this process and we've learned from those risks because there's been plenty of mistakes made in the past and plenty of folk that will be listening to this who've been involved in redoing work that was done in the 80s and the 90s in particular cavity wall insulation and the rest of it uh, because it wasn't done properly in the first place so getting it right is important to the extent that PAS 2035 can contribute that, I'd actually invite folk to put something, put your own comments in the box there, because what I'm going to say is, is what I'm picking up from speaking to colleagues over the last few years. Lots of concerns about the, the, the cost of it, lots of concerns about actually being able to source the skills, particularly outside the central belt. So are there enough people who can offer that level of skill and supervision? Lots of concerns about those costs uh, and, and lots and lots of concerns about uh, the practicalities, in particular the practicalities of in, in terms of supervising the workforce and the quality that's required to deliver this it's it's certainly an additional cost burden on the process um, it, it needs to offer value for money in terms of actually eliminating the kinds of mistakes that will that will do the damage that we're concerned about I mean just to digress for a moment I, I see Murray has who, who has a heat pump has popped a little comment in the box there and I, I Murray I don't know if you're in a position to share some of your own thoughts either sticking them on the screen or just just coming on and talking to us about them um, if that's possible because you know, our brief conversation yesterday, I, I thought was was really, really interesting from a practical point of view, but also the point you're making about levels of comfort and the uh, consistency of comfort was uh, was quite significant, particularly when we're talking about uh, health risks to the 40% of the social tenant population who are either pensioners or have some other form of long-term limiting illness. So, Mari, I'm putting you on the spot a bit, but it, I th genuinely, I think- Mari, I have unmuted you. I don't know if you're able to speak. Can you hear us? No, nope, he can't hear you. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um, I'll, I'll, I've got I'll get him to yeah. light it in the box. Thanks. Yeah. Um, what he's saying is um, the comfort level of a heat pump can't be discounted versus a discussion on the cost of usage. So um, I think he did do a comparison 
Yeah. Um, he, he sent me a little the email with the calculations, and so he did a he did a comparison, and it is slightly more expensive than gas currently. It probably won't be now. I think the difference was about ninety pounds a year, um, and so. But he said that the the, the house is a lot more comfortable um, with gas. It was you know you have to turn it off, you have to turn you know it's on in, on in the morning, on at night, um, whereas this is a much more steady rate of comfort. Um, and is that worth the money? And probably the answer is yes. I, I, I mean, I, I thought the point was it is important. I mean, Murray's wasn't the easy, isn't the easiest of houses to retrofit. It's an older property, under, without wanting to give anything away. It's not quite the uh, uh, Cluedo uh, type house where you can you know different things go on in different rooms. Well, it's not that a lot of vast mansion or anything like that, but it's a, it's a, it's certainly larger than your average council house, and it's and it's older than your average council house. And if it can be made to work in that context, in in, in a detached detached semi-detached property i think that's an important lesson but the point about comfort levels for me was absolutely key because my worry has always been that if you can't reach and sustain high levels of, of thermal comfort particularly for older people over you know throughout the 24 hours then you know some of the risks are are, are ramped up my apologies for talking about your house like that murray i've only driven past it the once so uh... <laughs> Um, I'm just looking to see if there's um, any more questions. Does anyone else um, have any questions that they would like to raise? Um, Apologies, I've just brought Murray on as a panellist. Can you hear us, Murray? No, sorry, <laughs> I have tried. <laughs> no, problem. no worries, technical issues. Um, yeah, how, what's your thoughts, Barbara and Dan, since you've done the training? How um, rigorous was was the process to get through your retrofit coordinator training? Um, I'll let Barbara, I'll let Barbara <laughs> comment. <laughs> yeah, I, well, I, I, I can't help to compare it with, with other trainings that I, I, I'll try to be realistic because I, I'm a Passive House uh, certified professional. So I, I think compared to Passive House School, it's, it's not as stringent, but I think it, it is from other courses and retrofits and uh, uh, trainings that I've done uh, and from knowing what a domestic energy assessor uh, learns and does, I think uh, the retrofit coordinator training, it's uh, it, it, it uh, emphasizes a lot on the, the importance of fabric first approach, on on how to design sure. buildings uh, carefully, uh, um, avoiding uh, one size fits all approach, um, uh, trying to to understand the the, the different scenarios and in, in in the UK uh, UK um, context and and so on. So I think it is it definitely covers. The whole, the whole house retrofit concept, but it's a, a, it does need a, the, the, the standard in itself and the training needs some a, extra knowledge and how carefully um, make sure that that's a, a, that issues happen in reality. Um, they, they, they introduced it, the concept of POE, building performance evaluation, but I think there is, if you do that, that's the starting point, I think you, you, you do need to uh, go into more and more details. Uh, but I think it's, it's a great starting point. It's, uh, it's uh, the training has been, the standard and the training has been prepared by excellent professionals. So I think it's, I, I would definitely recommend it. And the retrofit coordinator training gives you mainly a good understanding of what past 2035 is, even if you don't want to be a retrofit coordinator. I, I think it gives you a good understanding of what whole house retrofit is I don't know if you agree with that, uh, Dan or the others. Yeah, it's a good good introduction to all the topics and how to coordinate. But it's not it's not going to teach you the trades for all the different things you need to pull together. Um, but I think the discipline is good. Yeah, yeah, it's good. Um, someone just made the point. I think it's only by using real-world examples that we can move the debate forward. Um, and I think that's. Um, very true, particularly when you're talking about tenant engagement um, being such a massive part of all of this. I think, it's, yeah. I think it's true. Just to pick up on what Tony was saying as well, I mean, I, we feel for there's a housing crisis and the cost and stuff, and I think 90% of social housing is already at EPCC, and uh, it's not necessarily decarbonised because of the gas, but... Um, these the projects we're doing now with uh, 
with John Gilbert and things. We are putting heat pumps in and, and it's winning on lowest cost of to residents for running their heating. Mm. And that was before the gas price rise recently. Um, and I think the, you know, if you, I would approach it if you've got any units on electric heating, even if you everything's messed up, you buy the wrong heat pump and the COP's wrong and it's all set up wrong and everything, then it's still going to run it over to, you know, 200% efficient. Um, so the resident's still going to have their fuel bill in, in theory, so they'll still be delighted. Um, yeah. Maybe not reaching for perfection and fabric and everything perfect for your first heat pump project. It's selecting an easy win and, and yeah. you know getting getting in amongst it and putting one on my house. And I've learned a lot and just getting involved in it. I think. Sorry to interrupt. Um, we've got a technical question there. Um, what is the minimum heat demand or number of properties that would be suitable to be considered? for district or communal heating, new builds and retrofit? I'll, I'll go first on that, but Dan, Dan will have something to say as well. But So there's kind of two models to this. There's the, there's the ambient loop model, and then you still put a, a heat pump in each property. Um, I would be slightly cautious about that to some extent because it pushes a higher electricity demand out to each property, and that might be a constraint as opposed to a single cable. And when you take electricity into uh, account, uh, the price of it is also uh, affected by where you're buying it and how big the cable is. So bigger industrial customers get electricity cheaper. So spreading out the electricity demand isn't necessarily the right thing from the electricity perspective. So take all that as, uh, into account and thinking about maybe a, a 65, 45 degree, uh, let's call it medium temperature. Look, I'd be very surprised if that kind of made a lot of sense below about 500 kilowatts of peak heat from the heat pump. I'd probably expect something uh, about the same size in terms of backup. So you're probably talking about 1,000 kilowatts of peak heat demand. And Dan is now going to tell you how many houses that equals, because I can absolutely... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think an energy centre, we would be looking at over 50 houses and or unless you've got an anchor load and 25 houses like a school <laughs> but it's complex technically easy but complex to bring two entities together to agree to heat network but yeah. if you've got you know over 50 50 houses you could look at energy center uh, if it's under that i think you need over 10 10 to 15 to do the ambient loop economically um, so, uh, and that just speaks to what I was saying about you think about your neighbours. You know, this isn't just about what should a housing association do by themselves. We're all part of a society that all has to decarbonise, and we need to get people talking to each other a lot better and thinking about whether it's a school or a hospital or a cinema or it doesn't matter what it is, and, and thinking about the the way that these these zones. And you fairly quickly end up with bigger and bigger zones and, and, and it gets to that sort of size. Um, it kind of speaks to a question that you're maybe about to ask about Falkirk Council, uh, outlying areas with no gas supply. It's just wrong. Um, I understand why they're doing it. It's because gas is cheap compared to uh, electricity and heat pumps, but that's because of the bad policy that we've got. And when you take about, when you look at the life cycle cost, Dan talked about this, but it's worth re-emphasizing it of a heat pump, it doesn't matter whether it's a small one in my garage or something down at Queen's Quay, about 75% of the life cycle cost is the electricity price. So if we're using a really bad electricity price, we're going to get a really unfavorable outcome for the cost of heat. At the end of the day, people want to know what the cost of heat is, not what the cost of the heat pump is, not what the cost of the electricity is. It's, it's the levelized cost of energy for heat. And if we're starting with a really expensive commodity, of electricity because it's priced on the assumption that people want it anytime they want. Total inflexibility. That's just not going to. It's not going to wash. So I totally understand why uh, Falkirk Council, or maybe I'm not familiar with the project. I understand why they're doing it, but it's because of bad policy. So we need to fix the bad policy quickly, or or we'll keep building stuff that we're going to then rip out five, 10, 15, 20 years down the line. And that, that's just crazy. We, we can't afford to do that. We're not going to get two bites at this, Cherry. Yeah, I'll bring in Tony. 
Yeah, it was just an observation. So I, I, I missed. I don't know if, if a colleague from Falkirk was pointing to a particular development there, but it's a, 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 a kind of a tale of two developments in, in in my head, and they're seven years apart. And uh, I've now slightly lost the screen here. Uh, and and they pretty much demonstrate exactly the same problem. So my the last um, uh, new build commission when I worked with Stirling Council, uh, which was completed in 2015, just after I left. 53 flats, high density flats, five and six story in, in the city center. I, I, I... Well, we've lost you slightly, Tony, but hopefully you'll come back. Okay, um, I think, um, unfortunately, Tony's had some um, technical issues. Um, which often happens in this webinar world of ours. Uh, so actually that was kind of the last um, question that we had from our audience. So I'm just going to move to closing remarks and hopefully Tony will be able to rejoin us. Um, thank you so much to my speakers um, for joining us. That's been an excellent, really fantastic session. Um, thanks to the audience for joining us um, and all of your important questions. Uh, we've put some links for you um, in the box. Oh, Tony, you're back. I don't know if you can, you can hear us. You're back. You might want to. I think your sounds. Um, just need oh, to come back. I, I, yeah, I, 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 dropped, I dropped out there, didn't I? Yeah. I, I yeah, didn't, no, didn't. not at all. It's okay. Um, not Curs to worry. Cursing and swearing. I don't know how far I got. However, anyway, 53 flats, combi boilers. I'm now with Clap Mallon. Very pleased to be there. The first large scale scheme coming off site. It's really, really impressive. It's over 60 flats, it's 60 combi boilers. In seven years, we haven't moved on and this is down to advice this is down to the quality of the uh, and the focus in the design advice that we're getting that the sector is getting from uh, our, our, our architects and the, the uh, the ME specialists, you know, they are not focused on these issues and, we, and now, to be fair it wasn't Clackman on this building site it's, it was the housing association but if, if I would have thought both of these just jump out as ideal opportunities to develop some kind of decarbonized and and uh, communal to district heating system or uh, heat network locally um they're both city center sites there are both opportunities for other users uh, uh, around them but that wasn't the specialist technical advice that, that either council appears to have been getting or the the, the housing association appears to be getting I, my apologies Marty, because i know you were involved in that and i and i wasn't so i'm making things up a little bit but the point is you get two very large scale 53 flats in in a place like sterling and clapman this is a huge development the one in Stirling at 53 is probably the biggest social housing development, affordable housing development in 40 years uh, in the area. So these are big, big investments. And we're not getting the type of focused advice that we need. I, I'm also just because I'm conscious of time, uh, looking to draw some kind of practical things out of this session. So it occurs to me that familiarity is one of our issues and people haven't seen these things in operation, not in the retrofit environment. I'm, everybody's com comfortable with heat pumps in, in the more or less in the new supply uh, sector. The retrofit environment is the place that's giving us the challenge and i wonder and i'm inviting folk to kind of chuck something in the comments there whether or not um because i am still here with the alacho hat on whether or not alacho should be looking to organize um opportunities to go and visit and talk to and look at um some of the the projects that you've you've talked about today because i genuinely think that seeing it firsthand and talking to either people living in it or people managing it or the folk involved in designing it would be a genuinely a very powerful uh in into some of the practical problems but also the benefits and the successes that there are around these issues and at the moment i don't think anybody's able to to look around them and say here's a load of successes i can go and look at and learn from in a, it, as opposed to you know we could all learn from failures we've plenty of those but it, it's those positive uh, examples that i think folk need to see to give them the confidence that uh, that we can move on without doing the kind of harms that we talked about earlier on so I, and I'm, I'm saying to the guys that are with us if that sounds like a good idea, then by all means pop something in the chat or or uh, email myself or um, or share who's taken over from me, share uh, to, to express a view on that, because I think that might be useful. Yep, and we can certainly um, try to help um, organise that um, and um, we'd be delighted to help support in any way. Case studies, resources, free advice. You want to do another webinar maybe for your colleagues, um, you know, we can facilitate all of that. Um, and yeah, I was just... Um, continuing on to say thank you so much um, for everyone, all the speakers. Thanks to the audience for being here and all your questions have been fantastic. Really appreciate it. I've got a few details and links. Um, if you haven't already, um, you, I'll be sending out the uh, presentation so you can share that with colleagues. 
and your feedback is really important to us. So um, we send out a little um, feedback survey. So if you could take the time to answer that. Um, yeah, thanks very much for being here. And I'll, I'll just leave it to Tony for, for some closing remarks. <laughs> Yeah, who demonstrates his complete lack of preparedness yet again. No, I mean, that's that's, that's been a genuinely really, really useful session. I think it's given the kind of uh, balance between the technical stuff and the, and the overview on the policy issues. We understand some of the um, the, the issues around the, how the energy market works and, and the uh, reserve functions and the, the way in which the, the, the UK government makes decisions about that. I think we, we, we know that there need to be a change in the, in the pricing balance between gas and electricity as, as a central part of moving this forward. Um, however, we also need to have the, the, the right solutions on the ground that are going to work for tenants but one way or another. And, and we need to start to understand those fairly quickly uh, because you know, time is slipping away and if we are going to get put to doing it over the 10 years. So for me, this has been a hugely useful session. I hope it's been useful for folk in the audience. I think we do need to organise some follow-up though because I think there are still questions outstanding and folk do want to see uh, what what these things look like in practice. So we'll have a think about that um, and perhaps have a, a follow-up discussion at the next uh, full members meeting. But in the meantime, really just like to thank you guys for your time and effort in organising. You took all the burden off me uh, and uh, my only task was to fluff the introduction and the concluding comments, which I've done, I think, fairly successfully. Uh, very grateful for your time and effort. Thank. I hope everybody that's, that's still with us and has been with us through the morning uh, has got something useful out of it and we'll have a conversation about the follow-up and where we go with some of the stuff that we've learned today uh, next time we sit down together. Thank you very much. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thank you.